After their bumpy start in the 80s and 90s, it's no surprise that video game adaptations haven't had the best reputation. I mean, I'll go to bat for the Donkey Kong Country cartoon any day of the week. He's not lying, he's just a politician. Donkey Kong, the ape is on a mission. DK! But when the genre is filled with the likes of Doom and Super Mario Brothers, arguing that no, the camp is totally intentional and completely fitting for the franchise is a bit of a hard sell for most people. They have gotten a bit more respect as of late through the visually striking Detective Pikachu, alongside the excellent live-action Ace Attorney movie. But I think what adaptations needed was a series that takes itself relatively seriously, but has a lot of room for expansion that could only be seen through the medium of film. Something where the details were unimportant enough that minor changes could be made as necessary in order to improve flow, dramatic tension, or depth without sacrificing the soul of the series that appealed to so many people who grew up with it. That's why I think that Netflix's miniseries on Castlevania is about the best we could ask for. Naturally, if you haven't seen it yet, this video is gonna be loaded with spoilers. But with its strong themes of inevitability and powerlessness, it's not like you're liable to be surprised anyway. Ooh, someone's gonna fight Dracula! <sighs> the core story of the games is the same. Dracula, or someone imitating Dracula, is being really spooky, and a member of the long-standing family of vampire-killing Belmonts makes his or her, I didn't forget about you, Sonia, way through a dangerous castle to kill him. As long as you remember that basic structure, you can experiment a lot with the details, and that's exactly what the Netflix series does. Fundamentally, it's based on Castlevania 3, with Trevor, Sypha, and Alucard as its main heroes. But it pulls from other games, too, when it thinks it'll be interesting. Carmilla, initially from Castlevania II, is a very important secondary villain, not unlike her role in Circle of the Moon. Alucard draws incredibly heavy influence from its Symphony of the Night incarnation in both design and motivation. It even gets some particularly deep pulls in there, with Hector and Isaac showing up from Curse of Darkness. Even better is the restraint it shows in knowing what to cut. Sorry, Grant and Nasty, I love you, but your name is as dumb as it is amazing. And you don't really add anything that wouldn't be better integrated into Trevor's character. And the spooky ghost ship might have been a cool set piece, but it doesn't give you a lot to work with in the way of character development. What's most important is that your adaptation unwaveringly gets at the heart of the franchise you're working with. And I think the Netflix series nails this. The Castlevania series has always had a mixed relationship with religion, equally making it part of the hero's holy arsenal while also erecting enormous cathedrals deep in Dracula's castle. So the Netflix series incites the entire conflict due to the misdeeds of the church, while also making Sypha a devout believer in the good religion can bring in spite of... See? God hates me. That. This is the kind of nuance that can only come from someone intimately familiar with the source material. And I think it's the penultimate episode, For Love, that embraces the series' identity best, while also making the strongest case that a shift in medium was necessary for the story the directors wanted to tell. The episode starts cold and moody, the last of Dracula's army picking off the stragglers from Carmilla's betrayal. An event that never happened in the video games, but one that goes a long way to explain how a normal human is able to take down Dracula time and again. Trouble from within. Dracula is filled with bitterness, anger, and a lust for genocide, as we cut to Alucard, dreading what he's about to do. The library our heroes are in has collapsed from a dangerous battle fought in the previous episode, but Sypha is able to make an ice pillar that slowly raises them to the surface. Not only does this scene give some room to breathe before the ensuing conflict and allow Trevor to think about the legacy of his ancestor, Leon Belmont, 
but it also calls back to the franchise's most striking visual, slowly walking up the tower staircase before confronting Dracula. Sure, the staircase isn't actually in Dracula's castle this time, and they technically aren't even climbing up it, and it's not even stairs. But all of the moods are exactly the same. Fear, equally mixed with the determination to do what needs to be done. We get a bit of levity here as the crew talks with each other for the last time before their battle, as we're greeted with another franchise staple, ominously looking at Dracula's castle ahead. The heroes approach, and we cut to more fighting inside. Then, suddenly, they stop. I shift away from their battle, as all too familiar notes play in the background. After readying their weapons and discussing their plan of attack, Alucard only has one thing to say. Begin. Up until now, the series has been pretty sparing with Castlevania remixes, but if they were going to put one in, it had to be Bloody Tears. But it feels a bit different here. Most versions are empowering to reflect Simon Belmont's strength and conviction, but this variation feels more desperate, more final, like it's uncertain which side will win, but this bloody struggle to the end will decide their fate. You also get the highest concentration of sheer Castlevania-isms, all condensed into the scene. Cypha's spells are taken straight from Castlevania 3 this time around. Alucard's rocking his wolf form and sword familiar from Symphony, and Trevor's whip skills are so deft, it looks like it's homing in on and hunting the beasts. But honestly, more than that, they took the ideas of these attacks and made them better. Like, look at the choreography in this scene. After her ice crystals are swatted away, Sypha sends a crystal erupting through the ground. Her foe narrowly dodges, but Sypha focuses it into a plane of ice sharp enough to cut him in half. He backflips out of the way, and then turns the attack on Sypha, running along the top of the ice wall, heading straight toward her. But she gets the clever idea to rotate the entire wall while he's still on it, and... Yeah. A death worthy of the Castlevania name. But one so intricate, clever, and intense, it'd have to be done through cutscene or quick time event in a game, and is pulled off so much more elegantly here than could be done as a break in the gameplay's action. After burning some dude's face off in the most metal way possible, we cut to Isaac, the most loyal of Dracula's followers and the last thing standing between Drac and his son's rude gang. But Isaac is human. He would have to sacrifice his life in order to defend his master. In spite of his loathing for humanity, Dracula values loyalty beyond all else, and casts Isaac through a portal against his wishes, asking a soft whisper of forgiveness before forcing his final servant to live out the rest of their limited life free of shackles and masters. With not a soul in his way, Alucard finally comes face to face with his father. The tension's thick enough to cut with a sword, both sides unwilling to compromise, knowing what has to be done. Alucard shows that he's brought friends and rushes forward, blade drawn. And it's here that we get to see the raw might of Vlad Dracula Tepish. Dracula's pretty straightforward in the games, focusing more on hard-to-avoid patterns with a few stylish flourishes. But here, he's every bit the monster he's made out to be. He blocks the sword with two fingers, he doesn't even feel it when Trevor punches him in the face, and every attack they throw is blocked, dodged, or countered without a second thought. Dracula has been built up in the anime just as he is in Castlevania a being that all other creatures of the night bow to in respect, whilst only needing a few paltry demonstrations of strength, and seeming near unkillable once he's finally forced to fight. The battle is brutal and bloody, 
with Sypha needing to cauterize her own wound being a particularly uncomfortable highlight, until the three can finally pin Dracula down through the real superpower of teamwork. Trevor readies a final blow, Dracula slumps over, and prepares his strongest attack yet. What? It's Dracula! You had to be expecting a second phase. What's especially cool is that this giant fireball is one of his most recognizable attacks, and visually it's straight out of Rondo of Blood. But rather than a volley of small shots, here it's one big one, to better serve the needs of the story. It's not only desperate and more destructive than necessary, much like Dracula himself, but it allows for the three to come together joining forces in a way that's infinitely more powerful than blind rage. They turn the attack against him, and Alucard is left alone with Dracula. The next several minutes is a brutal back-and-forth exchange between father and son. The fight goes beyond the limitations of the series, showing what a murderous melee between two vampires could accomplish, defying gravity and placing a strength and weight behind the Lord of Darkness' blows that couldn't be expressed in traditional Castlevania proper, and speed that would be outright unfair for a player to match. Bloodlust consuming him, Dracula drives his boy straight through his castle and into Alucard's childhood bedroom. Dracula's eyes, filled with rage moments before, are flooded all at once with nostalgia and regret. He's killing his boy. He's killing the greatest treasure that he and his wife, Lisa, had ever created, and all in the name of getting revenge on those who'd killed her. Knowing that his crusade has been for naught, Dracula realizes the man he was, who loved Lisa with all of his heart, who was the happiest he'd been in his eternal life, must already be dead. Alucard truly sees his father one final time, before plunging his blade straight through the monster. It's not holy weapons, a legendary hunter, or even a more skilled and righteous opponent that slays Dracula. It was Dracula, and the humanity inside of him, reflected in his son, that ended the horrible night. Trevor comes in and gets the final blow, not that it's particularly hard to finish the warlock off at this point, and then Sypha burns his body. Though Alucard is the one that manages to prevail, it's the holy arts of the Belmont clan that get their day in the sun, Miramo Dracula preferring to stay in the shadows, just as in the games. As Alucard struggles with a mixture of emotions that will come to define the rest of his immortal life, one last homage to the series takes place. The three look on the horizon at a castle in the background, hopeful for the future to come. But this isn't Dracula's castle they're looking at, it's the one in town show them how much bigger the world really is. Some might take offense to the series taking so much artistic license. After all, it changes around character motivations, invents new events, cuts characters, and adds new ones. The actual adventure through Dracula's castle, which is so defining of the series, is cut down to this single episode. But this isn't another Castlevania game. This is a Castlevania Netflix series. The different medium brings with it different strengths and weaknesses, and the mark of a good director is knowing what to change and what to keep the same, in order to keep that same Castlevania spirit shining through. Dracula essentially defeating himself would be a highly flaccid ending to an action-packed Castlevania game, but given the tone, build, and slow burn of the Netflix series, it not only works perfectly in practice, it elevates the original character. I adore Castlevania and what it stands for, and I think it's the greatest honor that the creators were confident enough in its tone to deviate from the games where it'd be most effective. It might not be a literal one-to-one -one translation, but in my mind, it's how you design for adaptation. <laughs>